I think it was Alicia Friday night at our home. She asked me if I had a message. And I said, kind of, sort of. And then, she, I don't know if it was her or Linda said, yeah, but there's times that God changes that message. And today was one of those days. I got up this morning, I had my message prepared. I was going to talk about uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the two kings. One was a king of Israel, one was a king of Jerusalem, and Judah, rather. And uh, I was going to share on that, and I was all set to share on that. And God said, no, I want you to share this message this morning. And that's why we sang that song, He's a Waymaker. And God is your way maker. All I hear is the crickets. We want to welcome today uh, those that are watching by Facebook. God bless you. Hope you're blessed today. God is your way maker. Now, I don't know about you, but when... I hear certain truths. I get excited. My spirit gets lifted because for about a month and a half now, I've been going through a little battle of discouragement. Not depression. Don't get them mixed up. But discouragement. And you've got to battle through those things. You've got to battle through those times. But... When I was here this morning alone, and I was getting the songs together, and I started, I played that song a couple of times. In fact, I even hopped on the keyboard and played with it, you know. And all of a sudden, my spirit started getting lifted up. And I started really just getting into the song, you know, and just beginning to get into the presence of God. And I said, okay, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to change the message. So I ran in my office and did a few changes and stuff. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. And I want you to open up to chapter 43. Now, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what happens in your life, because I only see you on Wednesdays and Sundays and Mondays, some of you. And I don't really get to see you 24-7. I don't get to see you that often at my home. or uh, you know, We don't fellowship as often as we should, uh, for whatever reason. But I know that if I'm going through some things, that you will go through things. And I'm not the only one walking through the valley of the shadow of death at times. And we all are going through the battle. There's always an enemy, and he's relentless 24-7. The enemy of your soul wants to destroy you. He wants to take you out. That's his objective, right? Jesus said he comes to rob, kill, and destroy. So that's his mission. Can I stamp on him today, Mission Impossible? <laughs> Hallelujah. Because we're covered by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. And we need to take our position. We need to take our stand. And that's what the problem is. Sometimes we get to looking at things. You know, when that song was saying, no matter what it looks like, you may not see him working, but he's working. He's still working. When you don't feel it, he's still working. When you don't see it, he's still working. Come on, somebody. Isaiah 43, uh, verse 15, if you will. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray that you deliver this message through me. I'm just a vessel of clay, God. It doesn't matter. Lord, you speak to your people today. And whatever you want to give them, whether it be encouragement or whatever, God, I pray that you would instill that word into their spirit, not just their minds, not just their flesh, but God, it would reach way down into their soul and into their spirit. And Father, they will be encouraged today. They will be lifted up today. That no matter what was weighing them down, no matter what they're going through, Father, no matter what the circumstances are in their home and in their life and with their children and with their wives, with their husbands, with their un uncles, aunties, whatever it may be, God, you're the way maker. And you'll make a way where there is no way. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Isaiah 43, starting with verse 15, it says, I am 
the Lord. What does that mean to you? What does that mean? Is that just a statement that God makes? I'm the Lord, you know, like he's bossy. I'm the Lord. When he says I'm the Lord, it means that he is everything the Lord. He's the Lord of the sun and the moon and the stars. He's the Lord of the earth and all of space and all of science. He's, he's Lord of all. Come on. He's Lord of the universe. He's Lord of this earth. The silver and the gold is his, the Bible says. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. Everything belongs to God. Hallelujah. Now the devil has usurped authority and, try, and is trying to usurp that and take that over, but it ain't going to happen. Hallelujah. And it only will be for a short time. Then God's going to do something. I believe that God is about to birth something in this church and in this city, in Massachusetts, that's going to spark the world. I believe that. I believe that, you know, people say to me and ministers say to me, where are you from? And I say, I'm from New England. They go, oh, that's the, de you know, that's the, cer the uh, cemetery of preachers. Man, they just dry up and die. And my comment to them is, well, let me tell you something. When revival comes, the driest wood are the first ones to catch fire. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to catch fire. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I, I believe that with all my heart. Amen. I am the Lord, your, ho the, your holy one. Let me, let me look at that again. I am the Lord, your, your Holy One. The creator of Israel, your king. In verse 16. Thus says the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea... And a path in the mighty waters. Can I tell you that he makes a path or he makes a way in the sea of your problems and situations. And he makes a path in the mighty things that come against you of a way of escape that you'll be able to escape it. Come on, somebody. Or... Thus says the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. Hallelujah. When God called Abraham, he said, Abraham, get thee up out of thy father's house and from thy kindred and from thy um, your country and go to a place that I'll show you. Now, some Christians when God tells them that, needs to know all the details from A to Z. What route am I going to take? What city am I going to go to? Where's my house going to be? What, what's the color of my house? What's, you know, all of the details. You don't need to know the details. Abraham didn't need to know the details. God spoke to him because he was what? The Lord. Can I tell you that the fear of God is missing from many churches today? Can I tell you that the fear of God may be missing from this church a little bit too? The fear of God that when God says to do something, we just sit back and contemplate whether we're going to do it or not. That's very dangerous. Think about it. God says to do something and you don't do it. And you try to reason it out. Well, I don't want to. I don't have to. Imagine what you're doing with God. And God said to Abraham, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy house into a land that I will show you. Can, can I tell you, he didn't have a GPS. He didn't have navigation. He didn't set the address. God didn't give him an address. He just pointed him and says, I want you to go in this direction and just trust me. Amen. Amen. You're not always going to get the full roadmap of what God wants to do. But he says he makes a way where there is no way. And so with the Israelites, he also made a way when they were in Egypt. They were in bondage for over 400 years. Anyone been bondage this morning? 
Anyone have some bondage in your life? Some things that are nagging at you and holding you back and, and, and keeping you from the things of God? If you've got some bondage today, you're in a good place because God is ready to deliver you. The Israelites were in bondage for 400 years with the Egyptians. And there came a time, and say this, in the process of time, say it with me, come on. Are you all dead? What's the matter with you this morning? In the process of time, say it with me. Well, thank you. Hallelujah. In the process of time, God raises up a voice. Before Jesus came, God raised up a voice called John the Baptist. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. A wilderness. Hear me now. A wilderness. God looked at the world as a wilderness. He said he called John the Baptist to be a voice in the wilderness. And he went out into the wilderness. And he sat there. Well, what happened? There was this funky looking man with camel's hair. Eating wild locusts and honey. Probably looked like a wild man. But the Bible says that he didn't go to the people. The people went to him. They went out of wherever city or town that they were in. And they heard about a man. A man that was out there dressed in camel's hair and eating locusts and wild honey. Now, I don't have any attraction to eat locusts. I'm going to tell you right now. I don't care if you put honey on it or not. I mean, I used to squish those things when I was a kid, and this black stuff came out of it, and forgive me, I'm sorry, I will not eat that stuff. I don't even know what it is. Come on, somebody. But these people came out to him because he had a voice and he was saying something that had an anointing to it. And he said, I am the voice. When they asked him, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? He said, no. He said, are you Elijah? He said, no. He said, well, then who are you? He said, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. Can I tell you, in that place of humility is the place that God will make the announcement. Of the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says that there's going to be another forerunner before the second coming. God's going to raise up another voice. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the people are going to be drawn to it. Those that want the truth. Come on now. See, you can sit in your chair and you can wonder about the prophet. You can wonder what he's wearing. You can wonder what he's eating. You can wonder what he's saying. But you'll never find out what he wants to tell you unless you get up and go out to the wilderness to meet him. Come on, somebody. You've got to go out to the wilderness to hear the prophetic word that God has for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not in your everyday service. Come on, somebody. No. You've got to have ears to hear. That's why he says, I'm looking for a remnant. Within the church, there's a remnant. You hear me now? There's a remnant that really want God. There's a remnant that truly want God. But then on the, in the same place, there are those who really don't want God. And the Israelites, when they were in bondage and they were in Egypt... God raised up a man. Say a man. God raised up a man with his authority and his power to deliver. Hear me now. To deliver God's people from bondage. The time is coming when the things that have been troubling Christians, people, Christian people, that you've been praying for for a long time and God's going to break that thing just like that. 
I believe it. I believe it because I'm going to be a part of it. Hallelujah. God didn't just call me just to be a pastor and just to sit here and preach a sermon and everybody clap and everybody laugh and go home. When he called me years ago, before I was in ministry, I was in a service. I don't know if Bob Lewis, I don't think you were there. With Brother George. We were in Tony's basement. And the power of God came and moved like he did today. But I was really under strong anointing. And, and uh, I believe I was playing the piano. And I got on the floor and I was just crying out to God. And he came over to me, the pastor came over to me and he said, I have a prophetic word for you. And he said these words, he says, as Moses delivered my children out of Egypt, so shall you deliver my, 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 my people. That was quite a few years ago. But I believe that in the last day, in the last time of my life, I'm 62 years old. I don't know how long I'll be here. No guarantees. But one thing I do know, as long as I'm here, I want to do the best that I can with the years I have remaining for the Lord. That's why you say, Pastor, is that, why, why do you travel? Why do you go to those places? Because God is the one who opens the door and God is the one that closes the door. And when I walk through those doors, can I tell you, if you've been on a mission trip with me, it's not glamorous. Now, those that went to Guatemala, we, that was nice. But you saw what, how people lived. Can I tell you, those same people are living in the same conditions that you saw them in. When Brother Tom and I first went there, the first trip we went there, and we opened up the, sh the uh, bathroom door and we looked at that shower, you have to understand how they heat their water. They have a heater right on top of the, the spigot where the water comes out and the electric wires are hanging down. You do not want to wash and go like this, and touch those wires. When God wants to deliver his people, and God made a way for the Israelites to come out of Egypt. He made a way for them, even though they were worshiping idols. Understand their condition. When they were in Egypt, they could no longer go to synagogue. They no longer had sacrifices. They no longer could, could call upon God in the, in the outward, outward sense where they could do the animal sacrifices and, and, you know, and do the feasts and, and, and all of the things that they, they did as Jewish people. And little by little, many of the Jewish people became accustomed to the Egyptian way. The many, many gods they served. Many, many idols they had. How many know that idols are nothing? Do you know that in America we Christianize idols? We make them Christian. Come on. Just think about it. Somewhere, and I've always said this one time, uh, there was a, let me tell you this about this, uh, this man. He was, in a, he was in the Catholic Church one day, and he was kneeling at the altar. And you know St. Anthony, they got those big St. Anthony's. You know, they're about this tall, and they're on a pedestal and all this stuff. Yeah, he was in a Central American country, Latin American country. And uh, he was at the altar praying, and all of a sudden, one day, there was an earthquake. And the church began to shake, and he was, he was down at the altar. And what happened was St. Anthony was shaking back and forth. It hit the pillar on the side of the wall. His head fell off and hit the guy right in the head. So the guy had to go to the hospital, you know, and he got his head all bandaged up and, you know. And so... Uh, a few days went by, and he was back out on the street, and he was walking by the Catholic church again, and he saw one of the Catholic little bookstores, and he went in there. He was going to get a book, and he looked in the case, and there was all these little statues of St. Anthony, maybe about 50 of them. They were a dollar apiece. So he said to the priest, he said, he said, Father, he says, I want all those St. Anthony statues. He said, okay. 
So that would be $50 plus his book, whatever. So he walked out and he, he walks out and he sits on the edge of the, uh, the street corner like this. And he's got the box in his, in his thing. And he's got the little statues of St. Anthony and he's got them in his hand and he's breaking the heads off. Oh, did that bother you? Oh, she made a, ooh. Don't, don't worry, there's nothing wrong with those. Okay, so he takes the statues and he's breaking the heads off. So the priest looks out the window and says, what are you doing? Well, you're cutting those heads off of St. Anthony. He says, Father, he says, you've got to get them before they grow up. They're liable to grow up and kill you. The Bible says in Corinthians that if you worship idols, you're actually worshiping demons. Hello. I don't care how we make it look like a Christian. I don't care whose name we put on it. Don't ever make a statue of Pastor Bob. Don't ever kneel down to it and bow to, down to it, please. Okay, Because God will kill me. No, no, no. Don't even make that image in your mind. No, Pastor Bob, you know. No. God has a way of delivering his people in the times of their bondage. The Israelites were in bondage. They were in bondage to the thousands of gods that they served, and God raised up a man named Moses. And Moses came and he said, let my people go. And the Bible says that when they left Egypt, they left with more substance than they ever had in all of their time. How did God lead them? Anyone remember? Remember, they're walking through a desert now. You're walking through, through the land of Egypt, toward the land of Canaan. How did they go? Does God care about you as far as leading and guiding you with specific direction? Absolutely. There are times he'll give you certain things and he'll tell you what to do and where to go, where to sit. God ever tell you where to sit? You sit in a certain place and there's a man that comes or a woman that comes and sits right there or you see somebody, you have a divine appointment and God just says, I want you to speak to that person and you, sp you speak to that person and they get saved. God led them with, by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. God made a way for them to be able to travel by night and by day. And to the other people, they didn't even see the cloud or the fire. But the children of God did. And then when they got to the Red Sea, and their back was against the Red Sea, and they didn't have no place to go. Well, like if you came here, you can't go any place here, right? And then the enemy starts to pursue. God made a way where there was no way. He made a way by parting the sea. Think about that. God had to overpower the power of gravity that he created. And the Bible says, by the breath of his nostrils, he breathed and the water separated. For his people. Think about that. For people. The Bible says that God would move the earth for you. If we trust him. If we rely upon him, he'll give us those things that we have need of. God will make a way where there is no way. And think about it, he delivered millions of people. There was about two and a half million people that left Egypt. Think about that. How will he not give you what you need? He's a great deliverer. He's a great way maker. We sang that song this morning. Way maker. Yes, he is. He calmed the sea. Remember in Mark 4.39, you might want to shoot that up there. He's a way maker. What are you facing today? 
What are you facing next week? What do you have need of? Can I tell you, you're only limited by the, by the, the limit that you believe. If you believe for this, that's what you'll get. If you can believe for that, that's what you get. But you're only limited to what you believe. Well, I don't believe God can do that. I don't believe God can do that. He can do that. God will make he's a, he's a He's a way maker. Don't take for granted what God does. I remember Brother Bob when he was coming back from Florida and he was here for a while and we were trying to sell his trailer and we prayed and we all believed God would sell that trailer and God sold it. But then, you know, the, the lady at the trailer park says, but, but you owe us for two months rent. It was $700 a month, so you owe us $1,400. So that meant that would have came off the price of the trailer. And I prayed. I said, God... Let's see if we can take care of that. And I talked to the woman at the trail, and I said, you know, is there any way you can waive that? And she said, no, there's no way I could waive that. You know, that's not possible. You know, uh, and the trailer's he's got to pay the rent for the, the trailer. I said, okay. Well, thank you for trying. And we just kept praying. One half hour or 45 minutes later, she called back. She said, you know something? She says, I was talking to the new owner, and he, did, he said it, he would pay it. He's a way maker. Don't take those things for granted. He's a way maker. It's not a coincidence. Come on, somebody. That's a miracle. That somebody that already made an agreement, signed a piece of paper, agreed to a price, is going to pay $1,400 more. Would you do that? Sign a contract for, say, $1,000, and then go there and say, you know what? I want to give $1,400 more. No, you try to get a $1,400 less. Come on. Look at the scripture. And he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and it was a great calm. He's a way maker. Remember, they were in the ship. They were all nervous. They thought they were all going to die. What are we going to do, God? I got no money, God. What am I going to do? Well, who's your God? Money? He's a way maker. I don't know how he does it all the time, but somehow he does it. Just when I think I don't have any money, then all of a sudden I get money. I don't know how he does it. It just comes. But see, you've got to be a giver to be a receiver. When I gave to that fireman's funeral to have that man come and sing, 150 bucks out of my pocket. I'm not saying that to boast. I'm just going to show you about the faithfulness of God. Okay? 150. He usually charges 500. The guy gave me a break because I was paying for it. And it hurt me to reach for that 150. I'm going to tell you right now. It hurt me a little bit. So I gave it. A few weeks later, I get a phone call. Hey, this is the Yacht Club. And is this a... Robert Landry, I said, yes, it is. They said, you know, at the end of the year, we, after we pay all our bills, if we have any money left over, we share it with everybody. So we have a check for you. We're going to send it in the mail. You want to know how much it was for? 150 Come on, somebody. He makes a way where there is no way. I could tell you story after story after story how God has made a way for Linda and I. All of these years, he's a way maker. He makes it possible. 
times we've been sick and times that we've been not feeling well, and, but he's a way maker. And we're able to press through and God heals and God delivers. Amen? Amen. When Joseph was falsely accused in prison, think of that. Falsely accused. Thrown in prison. It took a little time. But God's a way maker. He delivered him from the prison. Paul and Silas, they were in prison. Remember they threw him into prison? And Paul and Silas in that prison. If you've been in prison, if you've seen anything about prisons... In America, don't think of American prisons. Think of a cave. Okay? A dock, low ceilings. You have to crouch over like this to get in. And a cave leaks when it rains. So when you've got rainy water, cold, dark, damp, and if you stand up, you have to stand up like this. You can't stand up straight So you have, if you walk around. So Paul and Silas were in that condition. And Silas turned to Paul and said, look what you did. You got me into prison. Why can't we be socially acceptable like every other church? Why can't we just, you know, be, you know, be tolerant? Why do you have to open up your big mouth Okay, and rebuke the elders and rebuke the Sanhedrin council and, and the Jewish people. And why are you going to make fun of the gods of, of the Gentiles? And now we're in this stinking prison. I can't even stand up straight. It's cold, it's damp. Is that what they did? What did they, what did they do? The Bible says they sang. We sang this morning, he's a way maker. But how many of you really believe that he is? How many of you, how many really, really believe that he's a way maker? That God can make a way where there is no way. Then why don't you worship him? Well, I can't worship him. I'm so, I'm so upset. Oh, so, uh, so much stuff coming against me. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, I'm defeated. I'm, I'm nobody. Nobody loves me. Shut up, devil! Just begin to praise and worship God. And if you praise and worship God like Paul and Silas did in prison, what happened? God sent an angel and opened up that prison door, and they were free. Hallelujah. But it didn't come through their moaning and groaning and complaining. It came through their praise and worship. God makes a way where there is no way. The way to be free from bondage is to praise and worship God. Hallelujah. Come on now. Don't, don't be like them dead Methodists. We're going to sing now. We're going to sing a hymn now. All right, everybody, don't get too excited now. You know, we don't want to uh, upset the, the, the denomination. So everybody open up your hymnals to page 374. We're going to sing now. As we take the offering, Jesus paid it all. Is that what God had intended? No. He said, you make a joyful noise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you come into the presence of God, hallelujah, you put aside yourself. Amen. You don't come in here to get something. You come here to give something. 
Hallelujah. As you give, as you give. But I don't want to. Then stay suffering. Stay complaining and moaning and groaning. And you won't go anywhere. Come on. You'll stay in your prison. You'll stay all bound up. Full of fear. Won't be able to do what God wants you to do and go where he wants you to go. Can't let fear dominate you. First thing Linda asked me was, when I had that meeting with the bishop, and he invited me to Malawi, South Africa, she said, is it dangerous? I said, well, danger. Where are you going to go plant that seed for? Is it dangerous? Getting on a plane is dangerous. You can't even sit by the window. The engine exploding and suck you out the window. Come on. Oh, I can't go, Joe. I can't go to uh, Africa. I'm afraid of planes. Why would a plane ever do to you? I'm, a, I'm afraid to fly. Why, have you ever flown? No, i never flown, but I'm afraid to fly. Come on, somebody. You're afraid. And there's nothing to be afraid of. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. If I'm up in that sky in that little tin can all the way up there, 35,000 feet, and that engine cuts out, there's only one place to go. And I tell you, you know what? It doesn't matter if you go. It just matters where you're going. Well, I'm going to go someday. You could be walking to your car. Believe me, I see more danger walking in a supermarket parking lot than being in a plane. Cars, zoom. You can get hit by a shopping cart and die. When God delivers you. When you travel to all these places around the world, like I do, and I go to these places, I don't think about how dangerous it is. I think about how great my God is. And I told Linda, I said, if I die, you get the insurance. Come on, somebody. What? <laughs> I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. Whether I die or fly, we're all going to die. One time or another. You know, we're all on that conveyor belt, you know? You know what a conveyor belt is? It moves up like this, one notch at a time. Every time somebody falls off, you move up another one. Every time somebody falls off, you move up a little closer. Every time you fall, because it's a point of time for you to die one time. So you can be on that conveyor belt of life, and guess what? When it's your time, and that conveyor belt goes, whoop. That's it. You know, only people... People are afraid to die. You know why they're afraid to die? Because they don't know where they're going. You don't have to be afraid to die. Dying is a good thing. Paul said absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that's what you got to look forward to. Hallelujah. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more heartache. Amen. Be in the presence of the Lord and all the saints up there. You know, living saints, I mean, you know, they're... Not these statues and monuments. Real life saints. How many here are saints? Anybody here a saint? Huh? Why? I get, no, I, people are like, what does he mean? Is it a trick question? <laughs> no, are you a saint? Come on, somebody. The Bible says that we're saints. Paul called the Corinthian church saints. You don't have to be, you know, stamped and imprimated by Rome. You're a saint. Hallelujah. God makes a way where there is no way. 
Hallelujah. I know someone here knows of the provision of God. Really, I don't mean, probably all of you do know about the provision of God, but I believe one person here, Debbie, knows what it is to have hardly nothing. And if I may take the liberty, all she used to survive on was coffee milk, chocolate milk, and weed. And for 25 years or more, that's all she did every single day. It's a wonder that she's not out there holding a sign saying, homeless, anything will help. And out of her mind, are you hearing me? She's an intelligent woman who can hold an intelligent conversation I'm not saying all the marbles are there. There might be a few missing here or there. Uh, I wouldn't be yapping, brother, because you're from the same cloth, my friend. <laughs> but God made a way. God made a way for my friend Joe. God made a way for Jen. God made a way for Victor, uh, uh, Nelson, and Vicky. I remember meeting Vicky years ago, before we were in ministry. She was a good little Catholic girl. Not so good though, you know. But we won't, we won't go there. Come on, somebody. And she talked to this woman and this woman named Sister Miller. Told her about Jesus. Changed her whole family. God makes a way where there is no way. And Annie and Tom, when I look, when I first met Tom, he scared me. <laughs> I'm serious, he scared me. We were, moving a, we were moving a washing machine from his sister's house. And he came out of the car and Annie said, there's my husband. And I turned and I looked and he had hair down to here. He had that look, you know, like get out of my way, don't bother me. And I said, God, that's going to be a little bit of work for you. <laughs> but we kept praying and kept believing God. Come on, somebody. You got to keep believing God is going to do something and work something. And we had Pentecostal fire, and he came one time, and he met that wild man, David Diamond. He'd been coming ever since. And you, know, you just keep praying for your family. You know, we have our spiritual family, understand. But I have a natural family, my cousins and my aunties and stuff like that. And, and pray God, you know, somehow touch them. And I don't know how it happened, but here's my aunt coming to church is her daughter and her husband coming to church and I'm believing for my cousin Peter now that's gonna take a little doing that's gonna take a little doing but I say this that God knows how to do a little doing okay now I'm believing him to come I'm believing his wife to come and I believe I believe this is what I believe okay that when they come and they surrender their life to Christ, there's going to be a healing take place in their marriage. Oh, they're together. They're together, they're husband and wife. There's some healing deep, deep needs to be done. I just see that in the spirit. That's just me. Don't be wondering and coming up unto me, ask me what it is. I ain't going to tell you. But you'll see. And my cousins and seeing them on the fire department and on the medics and all that stuff. See them come. And see your families come. Come on, see, see Robert come. Now that's gonna be some work too. 
He makes a way where there is no way. He's a way maker. Isn't he? I can't I even finish halfway what I'm saying. He made a way for Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They were in the fire. They didn't compromise. We compromise, and that's when God stops working. Don't compromise. Don't compromise your faith for a moment. Stand firm on what you believe, and don't let anyone persuade you. It's amazing how you can miss God's will so easily by listening to what others say. God delivered Noah. I'm going to go fast. God delivered Daniel in the lion's den. Think about that. Noah, God took him and his family out of the judgment. That's why I believe in the rapture. Not too many churches believe in the rapture. Sorry, if you're watching by Facebook, you see this pastor right here? I believe in the rapture. I don't apologize for anybody. I don't care who it is. Uh, some people believe in the, pre, uh, the post-trib and the mid-trib. I believe in the pre-trib. I believe before the, we even see the Antichrist, we're out of here. Come on, somebody. Because there's a restraining power that's holding him back right now, and I believe it's the church. I believe it's the Holy Spirit that is in the church, and once the church is removed, that restraining power is lifted. Come on. If you don't think so, think about where we'd be right now if Hillary Clinton was the president. Don't tell me there's not a restraining power, that God's using Trump as a restraining power to restrain evil. Yes, he is. Okay? So anybody watching by Facebook, if you're not a Trumpite, are you down Trump? Or you say, oh, you know, oh, how could you vote for Trump as a Christian? Blah, 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 blah. Read your Bible. God appointed kings. We're not talking about pastors. We're talking about a king. Okay? We're talking about a ruler. And God appointed kings that were ungodly for his glory. He lifts up kings and he puts down kings. And he raised up Trump, whether you like him or not, whether you like his lifestyle or not, to restrain evil. To give America one more time, one more time to repent. Amen? Shadrach, um, not Shadrach, Daniel in the lion's den took Daniel. Why did they take Daniel and throw him in the lion's den? Because he was a prophet. Come on. He was a prophet and he was speaking God's word and they didn't like it. They threw him in the den of lions. The lion's den. What did he do? He just went over and laid his head down on the belly. God shut the mouth of the lion. God's going to shut the mouth of the lion in your life. Come on. Whatever the devil is meant for evil, God's going to turn it around for good. Whatever's happened to your loved one, God's going to turn it around for good. Hallelujah. Just believe God and know that he is a way maker. Amen? Praise God. I'm going to close with that song one more time before we leave. Can I do that? Am I allowed to do that?